I just want you to understand something. We have a, an opportunity in this life, in your daily walk, day to day, we have an opportunity to reach those that, that do not know the Lord. And, you know, there's a lot of fancy Christian terms when you grow up. Oh, you're supposed to be witnessing. You're supposed to be doing this. You're supposed to be letting that. And that's all true. But I'm saying you have an opportunity to reach others. And we cannot waste that. We have a limited amount of time on this planet to reach people. So today I just, I just, I'm not going to go long. I just want to impart some things in you today. Please, please, let's take advantage of the time we have. And I know, it's good. God wants us to have rest, and He wants us to enjoy this life. Absolutely. But have things got out of whack? Have things got out of kilter? Have they got out of balance? Are we spending more time with our life doing things we want to do and doing just a little bit of stuff that He's asked us to do? And, and I'm not talking badly. I'm not putting anyone down. I'm not trying to make anyone feel bad. I want you to just really, anytime we come up here, the Holy Spirit's been ministering to me to share these things, and I'm doing the best I can to get it into to our language to say, think about this. Just think about this. David wrote in Psalms 139, 16, and I'll just read these to you, okay? In your book were all written the days that were ordained for my life when as yet there was not one of them. Job. Remember Job? Days are determined. The number of his months is with you. David said again, Lord, make to know my end and what is the extent of my days and let me know how transient I am. Paul said, God made one man, every nation of mankind, to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. How we use our time is a personal choice. And this has been something that people have talked about since the beginning of time. They started understanding there is a set amount of time for me to do what I'm supposed to do. And it has gotten shorter over time. But... Since the beginning, all in Scripture, there are verses about how much time we have and what are we going to do with those. Because in Ephesians, Paul wrote, Be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So, is that still relevant today? Absolutely. Absolutely. Make the most of your time because days are evil. You know, and what happens a lot of times is we tend to start kind of getting really comfortable, you know, very set in our ways. We get to a point where we're just like, you know what? I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to think about that. I don't even want to know what's going on. You know, and then I find a really peculiar position that I'm in because I want to know what's going on to be able to... to you know, help with the information. Not to make you afraid, but to make you aware. So that as we're praying, as we're, you know, getting our family in a position to build them up in the Lord, because we know that nothing here is going to last forever. Not one thing. But we set our sights on the kingdom and, and on eternity, right? Well, there's people that have no idea about that. There's a lot of people that don't want to hear about that. That's right. And you know what? You can't for someone to know about that. But what you can do is you can plant and you can you can take this, you know, Johnny Appleseed with your bag of seeds and walk through and just, you know, spread seeds everywhere you go until that one person stops you and goes, wait, wait, what are you talking about? Wait, what does this mean? And right there, there's a Holy Spirit moment right there. He set that up. He's arranged that because you have been doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're walking around with your bag of seeds and you're just like, oh, yeah, hey, listen, I'll let you know God loves you and keep walking. And that one person will stop you. And then that one other person. And then someone else will go, hey, you know. But I, I just, I want you to understand how important that is. I want you to get a kingdom mindset on what it is you're doing here. What it is, why are you here? Is it to work 20, 30 years, retire, and then, you know, no. I'm telling you that, no. 
you don't retire from a kingdom mindset. A kingdom mindset says no matter where I am, what I'm doing, yes, we need provision. Yes, I need to set my hand to something so it can be blessed. But I need to get seed planted. And it's not in a way that you need to beat yourself up. Kingdom mindset says, Lord, what is it that I can do? And you have peace about it. You have comfort about it. You know what? And I'm not saying it's not going to be a hard path. Because it probably is. Because you know what? It's an evil world. And for a world to go 2,000 years and to not think no one has ever pushed a point in 2,000 years that homosexuality is an okay thing to do. It is only recently. It's a cultural phenomenon. So now this new cultural phenomenon, enemy has always hated good. Evil has always been against good, but right now this cultural phenomenon is that if you say you love someone and you want to help someone and you want to bless someone, you're a hater. That's right. So this new cultural phenomenon, which is why I want you to understand and be aware of the word culture, because it can be a trap. Because we need to stick to what the word is. We need to continue on with our business. Keep on about being what we're about. And that's about him spreading, sharing the gospel and continuing with the little time we have left. Time flies, right? I mean, just yesterday I was 20. I had all my dark hair. And then I woke up and Rebecca goes, oh, I like your gray hair. I was like, oh, it's gray. I mean, does it not seem like that to you? Yes. Honestly? Get a kingdom mindset. Because here's the thing. You think you're ministering to a person when you're ministering to an individual. But guess what you're really doing? The potential in that individual is limitless. They can have kids. They can have grandchildren. They can have great-grandchildren. They can reach their in-laws. They can reach their parents who aren't saved. They can reach their grandparents. When you're ministering to an individual, it is an untapped probably just just amazing resource so don't stop thinking about you're your ministering to an individual the kingdom mindset says i'm going to reach their whole family by this one seed i just planted in this one individual you're reaching generation after generation and here's here's my bumper sticker for the week ready for this every opportunity to share the gospel is an opportunity to save a generation do you agree? Every opportunity to share the gospel is an opportunity to save a generation, that whole family. You know what? Someone ministered to my mom. Someone ministered to my grandparents. Someone ministered to me. You see what I'm saying? And you know what? I want our kids and our kids and our grandkids and our great-grandchildren. It is the potential to reach a whole family line to the kingdom before it's too late. Our, our perspective on sharing the gospel has to change. It can't be just like, you know what? It's raining today. I am not going to get out in this rain. Even though I know this person needs to hear this, I am not going to go out and minister to them because, you know, I can do it tomorrow. Because it's only supposed to be 130 tomorrow. I can do it tomorrow. And then what happens? Oh, man, it's 132. I'm not going to get out and go out there. That's too hot. I'm going to wait till it rains again. And I'm not, I'm not making light of anyone. I'm saying... I've been there, I've done that. Any opportunity I had when I was supposed to go out, oh, you know, it's my team, I'm on the witness team today, I'm supposed to go out and do all, you know, whatever. I hate that. We're, not, we're all on a witness team. We're all supposed to be getting out and doing this. We're all supposed to be working together, whether it's at your job, whether it's at work, whether it's at the store. You know, you go on vacation. You know, we were in Ireland flying out from Scotland last time, and we're sitting in the airport, and this lady just starts talking. I look over, and we start sharing a word, and Rebecca's over there hugging on her, crying on her, sharing the gospel with her. That's the, I'm, I'm just saying, this is what happens when you love the Lord, and you want, you care about people. We're not battling flesh and blood. Does everybody understand that? The people that are lost have been taught incorrectly or have not been taught at all. So you planting a seed just in one person and not worrying about what it looks like, what it sounds like. You know, how many of you really know people that you know need to be 
hearing the gospel. You know they need to hear this. And you know what you do? And Because this is me. I would go, yeah, but you know what? If I say something about that to them, it's going to change everything. It's going to change. Our relationship's going to change. Listen, yes. Yes. If I can't speak to them about the gospel, it needs to change. It, it shouldn't stay the status quo because I can't speak to them because it's going to change in us now. I can't reach them anymore. You know what? I can't go play cards with them anymore because it'll change. You know what? Yes, I would rather plant some seeds about the gospel in there and have it change for the better for them than to maintain some worldly relationship because I can get something from them later or they can, whatever. Yes, it needs to change. We have to care about people enough to love people enough like Jesus did. They told, you know, stay away, they're unclean. Get away, you can't, what are you doing? Hugging them. He was loving on them. He was ministering to the people he said stay away from, and they were the ones that needed it the most. They were just pleading for, for just compassion, for someone to just to, to talk to them. You know? And so Jesus goes, I'm going. You're not going to stop me, I'm going. And the disciples are flipping out. You know, they're going, oh, oh, no, you can't do that. We're unclean, you know. So what? You know, so what? I don't know. Heidi Baker has an, has an, an ongoing prescription for scabies. Because the people she goes and loves on, she is just affected with these things that the people, that, you know what I mean? And and she goes and gets treated and goes right back and does all this. I'm, I mean, I'm just saying that. I read this or we heard we're talking about that. Because she's got something right in her perception of people and how we're supposed to deal with people. You know, if you're afraid, you're going to hug someone that's got dandruff and, and, and lice and all this stuff. And you know, you know what I'm saying? That person is crying out. That person needs help. You may be the only one that can reach them. You know, I, I may talk to someone and they just don't, you know, yeah, I don't, I don't like that guy. I'm not, I don't want to talk to that guy. And someone walks along and, and, and it's like, there's, a, there's a moment there. It's like, huh. I said, do you mind if I talk to you just for a second? And something breaks. The, the, the wall is down. The guard is down. And you can just drop a few seeds in there about Jesus and the gospel. And maybe just a, a little bit, but, but that's it. It's not your job to do everything. It's not your job to do everything. That's the Holy Spirit's job. You're not the Holy Spirit. But it's your job to bring the gospel and to love on people and to show them compassion. Now there's a word. Every time Jesus healed people, what does it always say? He was moved with what? It wasn't an honorarium. It wasn't a speaking engagement. But he said, you know what? If you come here, we'll do this. We'll put you in the best hotel. We'll pay you the best money. We'll, we'll just get you here so we can no, know. You know what he did? He went and he found them. And he loved on them. And he ministered to them. And he healed them. And that's what I want my mindset to be. I want, I want our, our kingdom mindset. You know what? We can change history. You don't believe me? Let me share something with you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read most of this. Okay, so 62 years ago, there was a deacon, First Baptist Church of New Orleans, would leave his house around 6 p.m. every day to participate in the church's outreach and visitation program. So the church put a lot of emphasis, emphasis on outreach and visitation. So every night, this deacon would leave the church. And for every night for for a few weeks he noticed a young thin man across the street from him he always seemed to be sad he would sit on his porch smoking a cigarette and he would be out front and sometimes he would even wave and say hi to this guy and notice that he had a young foreign wife with him and they had rented this little apartment across the street and he noticed how sad he looked so he made a note to himself. The deacon made a note to himself that said, sometime I should go over there and formally introduce myself to this young couple. The young man looked like he needed a friend. And these are his notes. He looked like he needed a friend, someone he could talk to, and would probably welcome some friendly attention from somebody. No one was ever over there. It was just those two. 
But the deacon had people to minister to way across town as part of the outreach ministry. So he said, you know, every time he went by, he saw him, he would wave, he might say hi. He said, I have to get going. I have to be there. I've got a long way to go. I'll get back to this guy. So each week he waved to the young man. The young man would return the wave, but no other real contact ensued. Later that year, the deacon realized the couple had moved and he had never taken the opportunity to talk to him. And the deacon thought, wow, he goes, I'm never going to get to see this guy again. But he did. Saw him on television. His picture was displayed everywhere on every TV channel in November 1963. And he, only then he realized that that was Lee Harvey Oswald. He recognized his face. He recognized him on the news. And he recognized that he might have responded to a word of friendship or even the gospel the summer before. Lee Harvey Oswald was in real trouble when he saw him on the news. And it was only a few days later he was killed by Jack Ruby. And the opportunity for the deacon to speak to him about the love of the Lord vanished forever. Now that's pretty high profile for something. And it is an example but is that real? I mean, you have a lot of those things, the same situations, not the President of the United States, obviously, but different things where they're going through the same stuff in their families. They're going through the same situations over and over in life. And all they need is someone just to stop and talk to them and minister to them and share the gospel with them. You know, instead of worrying about how it's going to make us look, how it's going to make us feel, I'm going to get... This on my clothes, that's a bad part of town. You know what I mean? Who knows? Who knows what could have happened? That would have changed history. Jesus loves for us. And the compassion he has for us to take it to other people and to share it with other people. That's what he, he loves that. That's what he wants. He wants us to be able to step out and do that. It should compel us to get out and minister to others and speak into others' lives. We're supposed to help people in a time of need, right? Stop trying to decipher when someone is in need and trust the Holy Spirit to lead you. Stop using this all the time and let the Holy Spirit dictate how to do it. Don't think, you know what, I'm an eloquent speaker. I've got, you know what, I, I'm pretty good at talking to people. No, just pray about it. Get with the Lord and say, Lord, and we always do this when we pray for people. We say, Lord, what is it you want to say to them? What is it you want to say to them? Because you may have a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom. You may have something the Lord says, I want you to just say this and don't say anything else. And it'll just rock their world. It'll knock them off their foundation. That, you know, they've got this whole thing built up against Christians and Christianity to where when you say that one thing, it just goes right to the heart. All shields are down at this point, and you have direct access to their heart. And just say, listen, I just want you to know how much God loves you, and he sent his son to die for you. There's hope. You know how many people need hope today? Everybody. How about that? Your abundance doesn't mean a thing to someone that is drowning in despair. Unless you're an example of giving. Unless you're an example of giving. All too often, you know, we talked before the Donnellys, the week before we talked about emotional healing. All too often we let our emotions skew what the Holy Spirit's trying to do. Our emotions get in the way. We have to let ourselves be led by the Holy Spirit. Please, let's, let's get things back in line. Let's get things back in order. We do what the Holy Spirit guides us to do. We don't do things. What did Jesus say? I only do Isn't it good? You know, too often... We get in these religious roles and we're like, oh, we need to do this, we need to do this, we need to do this. No, no, no. The only thing we're doing here, and Rebecca touched on it, is we are doing what God asked us to do. 
And we're guiding that as we go forward by only hearing what the Lord says. You know, we're only going to do what we see the Lord do. So please, it, it, it's a daily walk you have to get into to trust the Holy Spirit to lead you the right directions. If you're about to just get in this, just blow up, you're going to get in an argument with someone you love, family member, whatever, you're getting ready to blow up. Is that what the Holy Spirit is leading you to do? I would say no every time. What happens? We override it. We know better. I can diffuse this like this. And you know what you end up doing? Making it worse. Now, no one's perfect. We're all, we're all working toward, you know, getting there, right? But in the process, we know. And we know what God is trying to do. He's trying to bring life and bring it more abundantly. Not make a miserable lifestyle. Not for you to, you know, like, oh my gosh, I don't want to go around those people again. My gosh, they wear me out. I'm just, you know... Awfully quiet in here with these eight people. <laughs> as Christians, we are to walk not as unwise men, but as wise. Now, does that make sense? <laughs> as Christians, we're supposed to walk as wise men, not unwise men. So to walk unwisely, which is the Greek word asophos, is a possibility for any Christian. You, you, any Christian can walk unwisely. So, a sophos unwisely means one who lacks the power of proper discernment, unwise and foolish. So here, so remember this if you don't remember anything. The fool is not necessarily the one who does not reason, but it's who reasons improperly. Because people can reason, oh yeah, well, let me think that over. Okay, yeah, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to do this, and it's not correct. It is improper to figure things out in an unwise way. Now, I know that makes sense. It sounds very simple, but we have to walk wisely. The, the unwise lacks God's word as a reference point for reality and divine viewpoint. So, in other words, we're trying to do too many things without God's word as a guideline, as a basis, as a beacon, as a compass, however you want to look at it. God's word should be guiding us and leading us with the Holy Spirit. And if we ever go against that, whatever the nature of the word is, nature of God, that is where we should be directing and guiding our, our steps. And it doesn't happen that way. So, very quickly here, I'm just going to go over a few things. How can we use our time wisely? How can we be wise in walking as Christians? <coughs> Number one, see each day as a gift from God. Every day when you wake up, see it as a gift from God. We, all throughout the Bible, are talking about, okay, we only have so much time. We only have so much time. So when you wake up, you have another day. Or whatever. You may have a portion of a day, but you have more time. And understand that. Instead of seeing each day as a burden, look at it as another opportunity that you've been given from God. Time isn't exhaustible. Someday, guess what? And people don't like to think about this. Someday our life on earth will be over. How many of you have family that's, that's gone to be with the Lord? Our parents... You know, are there? Um, we just, I'm just saying, it's really, if you stop and think about that, if you let yourself stop and think about that long enough, you're like, okay, I guess I really only have X amount of time left to do what he's asked me to do. And I'm not afraid of dying. I'm not afraid of it. We know where we're going, right? If you don't, after service, we'll see you right here. It's important. Psalm 31:15 says, my times are in your hands. First thing we do when we wake up is thank God for another day. Number two, commit your time to God. God gave you time for a reason. Not to be mishandled, not to be misused, but to be used for His glory. And to share the Word of God with others. 
He gave you time for a reason. There's a reason you have time. Think about that. Psalm 90.12 says, Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. We need to ask God how to time our, or, or how to schedule our time more wisely. Right? It might even mean uh, rethinking the way that we've used our time for years and years and years. We're in a routine. So we've got this, this routine down. We, we might need to rethink that. And also think of why we're so busy or why we're so bored. Maybe we should rethink our time if we're busy or bored. Too busy, too bored. Because there has to be time in there for him. Are we really doing what's necessary or are we trying to impress others? Are we trying to impress people how much money we make? Are we trying to impress people with our works? Ask yourself. Number three, set aside time for God and for others. I don't think you could ever hear any Christian say, I'm too busy for God if it is Holy Spirit led. Now, if you're doing things for works or if you're doing things for recognition or if you're doing things for a platform, if you're doing things to try to make yourself stand head and shoulders over somebody else, then it's probably not Holy Spirit led. How many days did God work when he created everything? How many did he rest? Okay, so right there he's given us an equation. Yes, we need to work. Yes, we need to rest. And we can't overlook one for the other. You know what happens with most people, most Christians? Is we relegate all of our spare time to God. And then guess what? We're so busy, we don't have any spare time. It's backwards. Like, okay, God, I, I tell you what, when I finish all this, I'm going to spend time with you. I'm going to spend more time in prayer with you. I'm going to do this. When, when, as soon as I finish this project, I'm going to do that. And you know what happens? The project goes long. Happens all the time. Okay, Lord, I'll tell you what, I'll get you next week. I've got you on the books. 2.30, be there, be square. You know what? 2.30, I'm not there. I'm somewhere else. You know what? If you can really imagine this and think of this as he's been right there waiting the whole time it's like a little kid just waiting to spend time with her mom or dad or it's even like that little puppy or whatever that you've got it's just waiting to play waiting to play and you're too busy god has been there the whole time standing by your side just going please i just want to spend some time with you i just want to talk i got something good for you are you ready to listen and then what happens is when we do spend time with him you know what we do we give him a shopping list every time. We're, we're talking so much, we're not hearing from him. Instead of just getting quiet and laying there and just soaking in him and going, okay, Lord, I just want to spend time with you. Just download. I love that. I love quiet. I love peace and quiet. I love when it's so quiet, you can just sit there and just hear. It, it's hard. It's hard to do sometimes because our world is so noisy. It should be opposite. We should spend more time with him and put everything else. I say, okay, yeah, I'll do that. I'll get to that. I'm, I'm going to tell Rebecca that from now on. But you know what? I'm spending more time with God. I am not taking the trash out. That is <laughs> the one thing that, you know. Remember, we have to use wisdom. So. Matthew 6. Matthew 6.33 says, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. It doesn't say, I'll tell you what, get everything done, make sure everything's in order, and then seek him. No, seek him first and everything will be added. All right? Finally, last one, take time for your own needs. Mark 60. Mark 6, 31, Jesus told his disciples, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. That's just my 
I like to read it that way because it makes sense to me. Come with me by yourselves. Let's get some peace and quiet. Let's get some rest. Right? We need that. If Jesus required rest, don't you think we do? He would always go away. He went to get by himself. He went to go by himself. He went to go spend time with the Father by himself. Where, you know, disciples are looking for him. Where are you at? Oh, he's over. Okay, let's, you know, you need to get quiet. Spend time here. Get some good downloads. Listen, if you are angry about stuff, past stuff, people hurt you, perce- you know, your perception is someone hurt you, someone made you mad, is it worth it? Is it worth it to get angry and waste that time that you could be spending with family, with friends, with God? You could be getting quiet and peaceful. So is peaceful angry? Is angry peaceful? Which one doesn't belong? You see what I'm saying? Remember Sesame Street, electric company? Peaceful. Why are you angry about it? Think about it. Is it really that important? So, well, they took this from me. They stole this from me. They took this from me. What does the Bible say to do if someone steals something from you? Give it to them. Don't even think about it. Give them, give them extra. Give them more. And you're going, wait, what? That's not what the world said. Okay, there we go. We're not of this world. What are we? We're in this world. Let's keep our eyes lifted. Let's keep our eyes on him. Amen? Rest is not wasted time. It's refreshment that prepares us to make better use of time.